Welcome everyone. This is Sarah from Curacao's Community Support Department. We are so glad to have you all join us for tonight's career panel webinar series presentation. In this series, our panelists will share their career experiences, advice, and ideas that can be helpful to all members of the SMA community. Thank you so much to our presenting sponsor, Biogen, for generously present, uh, supporting this series. We appreciate all the questions we received in advance of the webinar, and we're going to try to answer many of these throughout the next hour. You're also able to submit questions throughout the webinar using the questions box, which you'll find located in your GoToWebinar toolbar. Please note that all lines will remain muted during the webinar other than for the speakers. If you have any additional questions after tonight's panel, please contact CuraSMA's community support team at community support at curasma.org. We would now like to welcome our speakers, JJ Wett, Sarah Bogus, Kyle Durkowski, and Alexa Dectus. Alexa will begin today with an overview of her career path thus far. Alexa? Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be talking with all of you and sharing some career insights. So I am an entertainment lawyer and I work for a film and television production company in Los Angeles. Um, when I was a child, I needed something to do because I was diagnosed with SMA and people with SMA generally can't do sports. So I started acting and it was really fun and I was on a few children's TV shows, but I knew it wasn't what I wanted to do forever. So I moved from my small town in Pennsylvania to undergrad in Washington, DC. And then from there, I moved to law school in California. So it was very interesting navigating a cross country move by myself with spinal muscular atrophy. And um, we can certainly talk about that later if anyone has any questions on that. Um, when I went to undergrad and law school, I had to really learn how to manage caregivers because as people with SMA, there's a lot that we can't do for ourselves physically. So I eventually learned how to properly manage, hire, fire a staff of caregivers. I average about 15 caregivers on my staff at any given time. And that is the only way that I'm able to live independently. Um, once I completed law school, I got my job with my production company and it's been a really great experience. I'm one of the very few people with a physical disability in Hollywood on the business side of things. And so that's interesting because people aren't always aware of the things you might need. And so it's really important to advocate for yourself. And I've been able to learn how to successfully do that. And now I work and I love my job and I live what I would consider a very happy life. Kyle, do you want to go Should next? I go next? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, hey, everyone. Um, I'm Kyle Durkowski. Um, I have SMA uh, type 2, and I'm 33 years old. Um, I grew up in upstate New York, um, but currently live down here in Northern Virginia, outside Washington, D.C., um, with my wife. And um, uh, so I'm working currently as a, a manager of software engineers uh, for the federal government been with this job for over nine years now. Um, in college, I started out as a communications major because um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, but uh, I had to take a liberal education requirement for some kind of computer class. So I took intro to programming and I really liked this. So I kept taking more classes and then eventually picked up computer science as a major. Um, and that's kind of how I got into my field. So. Um, in 2012, I moved down here um, and started out as a software engineer, software developer, doing stuff like that. Um, and then uh, recently, over the past three years or so, I've been more in a uh, management type position. So um, <clears throat> before this, this is really kind of my first full-time job coming out of college. Um, I, I had a couple of part-time jobs during college. I was I worked in the production department of a uh, local TV news station, uh, but that was part-time, very part-time. Um, I also, during the summers, 
I was a um, camp counselor at a summer camp uh, for middle schoolers. Um, and I did a couple of internships in college as well. So um, yeah, but those are all part-time. So this is really the only job I've had since graduating from college um, full-time. So I'm um, happy to be here and excited to answer some questions going forward. I think I'm next. Yeah, so I'm JJ Wet. Um, I am from DeKalb, Illinois. Um, I have SMA type one. Um, I'm 36 years old. Um, I currently am the clinical director at the youth counseling agency in DeKalb. Uh, we service the entire county of DeKalb County. Um, I have my degree. Uh, my graduate degree in marriage and family therapy. I have my uh, undergraduate degree in family and child studies. Uh, during grad school, I actually uh, wrote a thesis on uh, sibling resentment in families with a disability and how that relates to parental attachment. Um, I currently have, I think, six personal assistants uh, that work for me. Um, I've really kind of learned navigating throughout the years uh, that to maintain, you know, a good team of personal assistants, like the relationship almost has to be mutual. Uh, so basically, there's things that I will do them, vice versa. So like, you know, for example, if they need a place to stay overnight somewhere, you know, I'll let them stay in my house. Um, I have a three bedroom house with my fiance and my dog. Um, I think during uh, my teenage years is really kind of when I found, you know, I wanted to be in a human service field um, because I was uh, a security guard actually for a while. Um, but my primary job was assisting um, customers to where they needed to go. Um, and so really my, my entire career, even when I was a teenager, um, has always been human service is in general. Um, and I've also run for office unsuccessfully, unfortunately, uh, three times and I'm very politically active. I'm actually also on um, my city's uh, human relations commission. So that's me. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Bogus. Um, I live in Knoxville, Tennessee, uh, and I work at the University of Tennessee. Um, I'm 32. I have SMA type two, three, and I do use a power chair um, at all times. Uh, I work at the University of Tennessee. I got my undergraduate in plant science biotechnology at the University of Tennessee and have a little bit of an odd kind of career path that I ended up with. Um, I also got my master's at University of Tennessee in plant pathology. Um, my first kind of, I guess, job through college um, was in a research lab as an undergrad researcher. And I actually got my master's in that same lab. And then when I graduated with a master's, they hired me on as what is a, called a research coordinator or like a lab manager. Um, so I get to work with all the graduate students. I manage their projects, um, manage projects within the lab, um, as well as having my own projects, managing the lab's safety, chemical inventories, ordering, um, anything that has to do with organization is what I do in the lab, um, as well as all the other projects. But the fun part is that we have a lot of visiting scholars, a lot of graduate students from all over the world. Um, so we get to, I get to train them and work with them and learn about their cultures and they get to learn about me and about SMA and different things like that, which is, I think, tons of fun. Um, it's my favorite part of the job. Great. Thank you, everyone. 
Hello, this is Colleen McCarthy O'Toole from Charisma's Community Support Department. And a huge thank you to Alexa, Kyle, JJ, and Sarah for sharing their introductions. For the rest of tonight's ses session, we're gonna go ahead and go over some of the questions that have been coming in from our attendees tonight. So we've received many questions on disclosing your disability in the interview process. Can you all um, go through if you disclosed your disability when you were interviewing? If so, um, you know, tell us more about that. When did you do it? How did it work? Alexa, do you want to go ahead and start? Sure. So I tend to disclose it um, immediately, almost during the interview process. The bottom line is if somebody is going to look at you differently because you've disclosed that you have a disability, you don't want to work for that person. Because even if it's illegal for them to do that, or even if it's morally wrong for them to do that, you don't want to work for them if they um, are going to not want to hire you because you have a disability. So um, I tend to disclose it during the initial interview. It's obvious when you look at me that I'm in a wheelchair. So during the phone screener, I don't always bring it up, but then after the phone screener, when I'm actually seeing the hiring manager, um, I always find a way to weave in, oh, and I have spinal muscular atrophy. Because when people are looking at you, my opinion is that when people see you in a wheelchair, they're wondering what's going on or why you're in that wheelchair. And so it's better to just tell them from the start, in my opinion, that way they're not distracted thinking about it when they should be thinking about your work and what you're capable of bringing to the company. So um, I, I, when I graduated from college, it was like 2009 and then grad school 2010. And uh, the economy was pretty crappy. So I went on like probably two dozen interviews before I got a job. Um, and I actually never disclosed my disability um, at any point, even though like Alexa said, it's pretty obvious. Um, but I guess my philosophy is like, you know, there's always that, that awkward moment when you meet someone for the first time and they realize you're disabled, uh, even though you've been talking or emailing or whatever. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's just weird. It's weird for them, it's weird for you, but whatever, it's human nature. Um, and I, I guess it's tempting to, for me to kind of like get it out of the way over the phone or, or to, you know, alert them out via email or something. But uh, I guess my philosophy is like, I'd rather, I'd rather be guaranteed um, to be locked in a room with you for an hour after that awkward moment so that during the course of the interview, um, you know, you're gonna see that I'm just a normal person who's totally capable like anyone else. Um, and I just don't want it to, I feel like if I bring it up during an interview, it, kinda, um, it could let them think that I think it could be an issue, which I don't. So I'd frankly rather um, go through the process um, just as anyone else would. And if I get a job offer, then um, you know we can talk about accommodations and stuff. But I kind of want—I I want to look back and think that um, you know there was no reason to um, not give me a job other than my qualifications or or whatever. So um, it's you know, like I said, I've been on a couple dozen interviews. It was a bad economy. Um, it really only backfired once. Uh, I showed up for an interview. And I got in my van and I was looking for the ramp to go in the building and there was none and there were uh, no elevator. It was just steps. So I had to call the guy um, and he came down. He was apologetic and explained that it wasn't an accessible building, which was obvious at that point. But um, he was nice about it. He offered to interview me in my car, but I was like, I'm not going to waste your time or my time because obviously I'm not going to work here. So um, that was the only time I really backfired. But um one quick like story about interviews sometimes you know the interviews that i think i did the worst in turned out to be the best um i went to an interview once in a hotel it was like a big hiring event so it was uh like a convention a convention center type conference room and it was filled with people interviewing at tables and i had to wait for my turn and then it was my turn so i went and uh there was a guy sitting at a table and the table was covered with a tablecloth. 
and it went all the way down to the floor. And um, I kind of thought, well, I hope I don't hit the leg, but nothing I could do. So I took a chance and drove up to it and knocked right into the leg and spilled the guy's coffee all over him. Um, and But the interview went on. And that's actually the job that I got and I'm still working at today. So I don't know, maybe you kind of loosen things up uh, once that happened. And I kind of figured, well, what if I have to lose now? So um, that worked out, but that's my experience. That's a great so, story, Kyle. <laughs> JJ? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, I want to touch on two points that were already brought up. Um, first with Alexa, is you don't want to work for someone that's going to discriminate against you. Um, I have actually been at interviews um, where they have outright discriminated against me, but obviously you can't prove it if it's not record recorded. Um, but what happened uh, one time was I was interviewing to work for a substance abuse center and they had three people interviewing me. Um, two of them left and thought they shut the door behind them, and they didn't. Um, and so in the hallway, I heard them say out loud, you know, we really like this guy, but we're not sure if our clients can handle him. And, you know, I... I didn't say anything, but obviously I walked out of that interview uh, pretty defeated. And so if they would have even offered me a job, I don't think I would have taken it because, um, you know, I, that's the mentality that they had going into it. Um, and then as far as uh, disclosing, um, the way I often do it, um, and I actually just did that because I accepted another position elsewhere and I'm actually moving somewhere else, uh, a different company in a few weeks, um, is I always ask if they're wheelchair accessible before I go. Um, that way it puts it on their radar. Hey, this guy's in a wheelchair. He may need some accommodations. Um, and so, um, you know, the few that I went to last week, um, you know, of course, they responded, yeah, we're wheelchair accessible, and just let us know whatever accommodations you need. And um, th that was like music to my ears, um, especially after, you know, some of the interviews I've been on, where it hasn't been accessible, and um, they automatically just say, well, this job isn't going to work for you because you have to climb up, you know, two sets of stairs to get up stairs. Um, and so that's why I generally disclose in the beginning, because no offense, I'm not going to drive an hour to get there to realize the place is inaccessible for me to work. Um, just because I, if I can't work there in the first place, why would I go? Um, and so that's why, in my mind, that's why I disclose if they offer me an in-person interview. So I want to definitely echo the part where Alexa said, I don't want to work for someone that doesn't want to hire somebody with a disability. I completely agree with that one. Um, on so I'm in the sciences and sciences typically use a CV, which is much longer than a resume. And we can put anything pretty much on there. So a few things that are on my CV kind of point towards a disability. Um, things like I'm a chapter officer for Cure SMA and a few other organizations. Um, so that's kind of their first flag if they notice it, which I doubt many do. Um, and the other thing that I do is I always ask before going if it's wheelchair accessible. And I do that for the same reason JJ said, I don't want to go there if it's not. But also to show that just because I'm in a wheelchair, I still, I plan ahead and I think of these things and I mitigate the problems before they become problems. So to me, that's, 
an important thing to show them that you're willing to do and that you do actively do. Um, and then in the interview, the first question is always tell me about yourself. And so I always bring it up in the tell me about yourself. And I put everything with SMA in a very positive light, um, talking about the things that I can do. And even though I have SMA, these are this, this, and this is how these things would work kind of things. Things that they may be thinking, well, she can't do this because of this. And so instead of them asking, I immediately bring it up and saying, this is how I would do this um, to kind of ease those tensions. That's great. Thank you, everyone. Our next question, we have several questions actually on this, and I'll get to addressing a few of them, but are on accommodations, which we could honestly probably have an entire series on, on itself. Um, first question is, how have you all managed your accommodations in your workplace? And then what were some of the accommodations that you have all received? Do you want to go ahead and get started, Alexa? Sure. So I am of the philosophy that spinal muscular atrophy is my problem, not my company's problem. Um, my company does not make me feel that way. That's just a me thing that I go into with every job. So I ask for what I need, but I try to keep it as minimal as possible as not to um, like abuse the fact that I have spinal muscular atrophy. So I ask for um, the location of an accessible bathroom. If there's, if it's a secure building, I ask for my caregiver to be able to come to the building around lunchtime to help me use the bathroom. So whether that's um, via like getting an extra ID card or whatever I need to get them into the building around lunch to use the bathroom. Um, I ask for a MacBook instead of a PC because I feel like the accessibility settings on Mac are superior on a PC than, than on a PC. And um, that's that's about it. I don't, I um I try to keep it very very minimal, and they're always super willing. Like everywhere that I've worked, they always want to do more. Like at my company now, um, they're amazing, and they I didn't ask for automatic doors, and they took it upon themselves to put automatic doors everywhere that I could possibly be going um, in the building, and that's incredible. And if you can find a company where they, they're offering you things that you're not even asking for, that's a really good place to be if you have spinal muscular atrophy because the, their attitude isn't what, what do we have to do, their attitude is what can we do. And um, I feel very fortunate to be at a place like that because it can be very challenging when that is not the attitude of your company. Yeah, those are those are great points, Alexa. Um, for me, uh, working for the federal government, so it has drawbacks. Like the, there's a lot of bureaucracy. Um, a lot of things tend to move at a glacial pace, um, but the pros are really good. So one of them is we have a really great reasonable accommodations office. Um, so basically, it's an entire staff of people who their sole job is to help um, you know folks like me and whatever disability you have they'll help you with it um so it's it's a pretty easy process i think they even have to do it like within 30 days um by i don't know if it's a law if it's their own policy but um you know it's it's one of the quicker things in the government to be honest um so yeah usually when i start in a new position or at a new location um i ask for a lot of um sort of like environmental changes you know so like at my desk i might ask for um, um a, a different keyboard um you know the keyboards with the um the numbers on the side you know like the number pads are built in are always kind of like bulky for me so i ask for a smaller keyboard um i might ask for like a mouse that's easier for me to click um i typically ask um you know with my desk for like the bank of drawers to be taken out from underneath so i can get under easier um, stuff like that, ADA accessible badge readers, um, all those environmental things that I tend to, I tend to ask them like in the beginning and then pretty much once I have my, my work environment set up, I'm good to go. 
um, and I'm fairly independent. So, but the other big, probably the best combination that I've come across um, is that the building I work in, we have an occupational health nurse uh, down on the first floor and she's there full time. So um, I asked the accommodations office if she could help me go to the bathroom every day. So um, pretty, pretty much whatever time I want, she's always there. She doesn't, you know, she doesn't have a whole lot of customers. Um, so if I need to use the restroom, I go down and she helps me and um, I don't need to have anybody come in from the outside. Um, so it's super convenient and it's really liberating to know that I can just have that whenever I need it. And um, I think that's kind of, it's, you probably wouldn't see that in a smaller company. I think it's probably unique to a, a larger company or, um, you know, an organization, you know, the size of a government agency. So um, that's definitely a huge perk for me. And I think if I didn't work for the government, I would probably be looking for, um, at least to start, I'd probably be looking for kind of a major corporation who would have more resources to do stuff like that, um, as opposed to like a startup, you know, unless like you're the founder and you can do stuff like that. But, um, yeah, that's my experience. So for me, uh, when I'm at work, I always have uh, a personal assistant with me because I have 24 seven personal assistants. Um, and so the biggest one for me is always having a spot for my assistant to be or sit uh, because my assistants do not come in with me uh, when I see clients, um, just because obviously that's a, another barrier um, with the client is, you know, building that relationship, having another person there just kind of makes it more awkward. Um, and so the biggest thing is having a place for them to sit. Um, and pretty much every company that I've worked for uh, has just allowed them to either sit in my office or if I didn't have an office, some type of workstation or another. Um, the job I'm moving to um, is going to be the first time my assistant actually has to sit in the waiting room um, because they don't have enough uh, rooms for them to sit in my office while I see clients. My office is going to be where I'm seeing clients. Um, and then as far as any other uh, technology related commendations. Generally, what I do is I purchase them myself um, as long as the company is okay with it. So, for example, um, I use a touchpad, whereas most people use a mouse. Um, so, I will purchase a touchpad for work um, and then, I'll, of course, have my own at home. Um, and then I think overall, um, people with SMA, I've learned throughout the years, are just super creative in the ways that we accommodate to our environment in general. Um, so, you know, whether it's needing privacy to go to the restroom, whether it's needing privacy um, to do a YouTube feeding like I do, um, you know, we figure out ways to do it. And it's just, it's really being creative with your employer. Um, just like I was saying before, to have that mutual relationship to ensure that you're getting um, everything you need in your workplace uh, to maintain your health. Um, I'll start with saying back in college, um, I, I've been super lucky and I think a lot of it just comes from communication. Um, so back in college, I would, in the lab classes and things, I would need, you know, maybe a table a different height or, you know, the classroom sometimes moved to an accessible building. Um, but I would just discuss it with the professor. I would send the professor an email and talk to him about it. And they were always more than willing to help. So I think just communication has helped in that regard tremendously. It was 
even easier than going through the disability services that the university provided. Just talking to the people and they were so happy to help and figure out whatever would work best for me, which was fantastic. Um, for my job, I'm in charge of buying and there's some, there's some good to that. I can choose exactly what we buy and what we don't buy. So for things in the lab, I can buy the more expensive thing that because it's easier for me and it's just because we need that. Um, they did come in and like Alexa, they automatically put in automatic doors for me, even though I didn't ask for them. And they've got them on my lab and my office. Um, and those are fantastic. I didn't think that I needed them, but they, they help so much. They make things so much easier. Um, the maintenance guy in our department is amazing and he's always thinking of me. And so he goes around and loosens the tension on doors that don't have automatic door openers um, so that they're easier for me to open. Um, and then the graduate students in my lab are great. Um, there's a few things that I can't do, like closing one of our big freezers um, is really hard to do. And they know that that's difficult for me. So I'll just send a text and say, can I have inspector gadget arms for minus 80? And they know what I need and they just come and fix it. Or I'll say, can I have inspector gadget arms for reaching this or that? Um, we keep certain things on a lower shelf so that I can get to them. Um, and they know to keep that stocked. So they always pay attention when putting things away at what level my shelf is at and then just refilling it as it needs. Um, and my work also recently, we had to go on a field trip to some nurseries um, to meet with people. And typically in the past, because university doesn't have any accessible vehicles, I have to take my own and then we just get reimbursed mileage, which is fine and it's not a huge deal. Um, but my boss was like, you know, no, let's all go in one car because we all couldn't fit in my car. And he's like, so send me, you know, how to rent one. So we rented an accessible van for the day for all of us to be able to be in one car so that we weren't split up, which was fantastic and great. Um, and like I said, I've been with this guy for a while. Um, sorry. Hey, were you, did you finish your point, Sarah? You... Sorry, go ahead, Kyle, and add something. Oh, yeah, so I just, I wanted to tack on, you mentioned, um, like, having a relationship with the maintenance guys. That is um, a fantastic point. Um, it's something that I also do um, out of necessity, too, but it's, like, if you build a relationship with the maintenance staff or, like, the building engineer, like, the people who actually do the work, um, and sometimes it's a lot easier to get things done that way. I had a situation once where the um, the automatic door button to get in the building it wasn't it wasn't malfunctioning, but it was kind of loosening over time to the point where as hard as I pushed, it wouldn't activate. And I knew it was like a simple fix. It was just like if they could just tighten the screws, it would work just fine. And I like I went through the process to try and get it fixed, and the manager of the building at the time was just not receptive at all. And I ended up getting like a verbal argument with him because he just wouldn't go outside the process. Um, he, he was like, well, I have to call a contractor for a third party opinion and I have to get an independent government cost estimate and I have to like follow all this red tape process. And I'm like, dude, it's like November, it's getting colder and I have to wait for people to come along to open the door for me just so I get in the building. So. Eventually, I just left his office and I went and found Tom, my uh, engineer friend who does all the work in the building. And I was like, Tom, can you just grab a Phillips head and tighten this up? Because it's really all it needs. And that's that's what he did. And it was no one ever put a ticket in for it, but it worked out. And um, sometimes you just have to kind of do that stuff. And, and so building those relationships are really important, like Sarah said. Yeah, and I'll add to that too. Another thing to really get to know your maintenance guys is to make sure one of the elevators is on backup power. Um, if there is backup power or something along those lines, because we definitely learned the hard way in my building that when they built it, they did not actually install the backup power that was supposed to be installed. And so one day they ended up all having to carry me down the stairs 
and then carry my wheelchair down because the power had went out in the building and it was not going to be back on anytime soon. And I work on the third floor. Um, so after that, like they made sure one of the elevators was on backup power. And I, I think that knowing the maintenance guys has probably been the best thing um, for my job. Besides that everybody is just fantastic to work for, but they do awesome stuff and they make sure that things are set up because they know somebody is working there in a wheelchair and they care about that person. And I think that's your biggest thing to do is to make sure that they know you, there's a face to you, and then they will keep that in their mind. That's so great. Thank you all so much for that. We've actually had so many questions come in about personal care attendance. So I wanna kind of start jumping on some of these questions. Um, the first one that we had, and we basically have had several on this, is how have you managed personal care assist attendance in the workplace while you're working? Um, another question is how have you managed their schedules um, around your, your own work schedule? Uh, Alexa, do you wanna go ahead and start? And then we'll go through everyone. Yes. So. I, as I said before, I manage a staff of roughly 15 personal care attendants, and it is the only way that I'm able to live independently and do the job that I do. Uh, the way that I manage their schedules around my workday is basically, um, it basically revolves around when I have to go to the bathroom, because as I'm sure everyone on this panel knows, going pee is just a problem when you have spinal muscular atrophy. And so uh, I typically have someone help me get to the office in the morning. That way they can help me use the bathroom as soon as I get there. And then um, I'll have someone stop by around lunchtime, but that involves planning your water. So I know exactly what time I can drink a bottle of water. And then um, after someone stops by at lunchtime, I usually will drink another bottle of water at the end of the workday and then have someone meet me back at my apartment. Um, so that's kind of how I manage their schedule. It requires a lot of planning because there are a lot of people that take care of me, but it's super important that you have a very large staff, especially if you're living independently, because if somebody gets sick or if somebody calls off, you have to have backup. Um, what was, Colleen, what was the second part of that question? I'm pulling it. It was, um, and how have, you, how have you managed their schedules and just scheduling your PCAs around your whole work schedule? You kind of started on that. Yeah, so to schedule them around my work schedule, um, I, I hire a lot of students and um, I hire a lot of people. That's, that's really how I schedule them around my schedule is by having enough people so that their availability, so that somebody's availability will always line up with what I need during my workday. Oh. Um, so for me, I, I don't have any PCAs. Uh, I did when I was um, younger and in school. Uh, but pretty much as soon as I got my first paycheck, uh, I no longer qualified for any kind of assistance there. So um, luckily, you know, I'm really blessed. I have my wife and I have my parents who, who live down here now too. Um, and my dad's retired, so he drives me to work and takes me home every day. So um, I've been able to, you know, manage that way, which is great. Um, and like I said, once I'm at work, I'm fairly independent because I have everything set up the way I need it. Um, so I haven't needed PCAs. <clears throat> um, I'm sure someday I will, and someday I guess I'll just have to pay out of pocket uh, unless I find some other program, but I've been unsuccessful so far in that endeavor. Um, but one other thing I, I forgot to mention when we were talking about reasonable accommodations is that um, my agency actually has a program where they will um, hire PCAs. So uh, I haven't needed one because, like I said, I, I have the occupational health nurse in the building. Um, and that's actually more convenient. But um, at, at one point, I was working in a different building for like a year and a half. And 
there was no nurse in the building. So um, they did hire a PCA to come and help me go to the bathroom uh, every single day. And if, you know, while she was there, if I needed anything else, which I typically didn't, but if I needed to, like, she could help me with getting lunch, you know, in the cafeteria or moving things around at my desk or whatever. Um, but yeah, like, like Alexa said, it requires a lot of planning and um, bladder control because you're pretty much committed to going to the bathroom at the same time every day. Um, and also it, it's, it's also tricky with meetings, I find, um, because, you know, if someone sees a free spot on your schedule, they'll schedule a meeting and then, you know, it's kind of awkward to say, well, that's actually my, my pee time. So, um, you know, maybe you have to block that off in your schedule and say private or something, I don't know, whatever. But yeah, it definitely requires planning and um, fortitude. <laughs> So I think unlike the rest of you guys, I'm actually the privileged one here who has a 24-7 PA. Um, so basically I can go to the bathroom whenever I need to um, and do whatever I need to at work. Um, I, Whenever I hire them, I, I kind of just tell them basically they are my hands. Um, so they're the ones that have to, you know, open doors. They're the ones that have to, um, you know, open my computer. The ones that have to set me up, my computer, all that. The ones that have to help me go to the bathroom. Um, and so I think, you know, having that privilege, um, you know, really allows me to not have to have that schedule. Um, and I know you guys are probably looking at me with envy right now when you have to pee. Um, but I get, you know, having the scheduled times that you can go to the bathroom, that you have enough time to go to the bathroom, all that. Um, because the job I, that I'm moving to, um, I'm probably going to have to see seven clients in a day. So that's like seven hours pretty much back to back to back to back. And, uh, you know, I'm going to have to take those few minutes between to, you know, rush as quickly as I can to get everything I need to get done. done. Um, and then as far as how I manage them around my schedule, um, yeah, I just kind of tell them, you know, I, I say this is what I need. Um, you know, if I need them to come in early, because I have a presentation somewhere or whatnot, you know, I'll say, you know, I, I need you here at 7.30 instead of 8. Um, and with the new job, um, I am going to have to shift their schedules. Um, they're originally 8 to 8 right now, uh, but I'm going to have to switch it to 10 to 10. Um, and really, you know, if they can't do it, then, you know, I'd say, well, then I'm going to have to hire somebody else that can do it. Because, um, you know, it, it's, they're here for me. They're not here for them. Um, and I know that that kind of goes against what I said about the mutual relationship. But I think that, you know, at the end of the day, they are the ones that are here for you. So I don't necessarily have PCA services like Kyle, um, but I still I have someone that helps me in the morning, um, live with my mom, and she does morning and night time. Um, during the day, I don't really have anyone that helps me. Um, P-Math is a real thing, and I definitely live by it. Um, very strong. I do have a few people at work that will take me if I need them to for whatever reason. Um, and I think that that's really important to find a few friends that are willing to do that if you need it that you work with or that are at least in your building. Um, I try not to mix too close to work, but at least that work in my building, um, which I think is really helpful because then they're there if I need them and I know who I can go to. Um, so I try and always have a backup plan of a backup plan. Um, 
but yeah, scheduling is not the easiest. With the calendar thing, um, one thing that's nice about being the lab manager is that I'm usually the one that ends up organizing the meetings and people give me their schedule. So I can kind of just pretend that something didn't work out during this time or that time um, to work it around when I do get to pee or when it's time for me to head home because that's at a specific time um, and gives me enough time to get home, go to the bathroom, and then if I need to open up the computer and jump on a Zoom call. Um, so that seems to, to work out pretty well for me. Um, and if anybody else is organizing it, I just say, oh, I'm sorry, I have a prior obligation during that time. Um, and that seems to work. They usually don't ask too many questions, but it's definitely sometimes a struggle. Great, thank you all so much. I have a related question to this. We have several questions um, asking about this, but for those that do have personal care attendants, um, the question is, I'm interested in knowing how everyone pays for their caregivers if they are working and have income. How does, does it affect their federal and state benefits? Alexa, do you wanna go first? So when I started working, I lost everything. And I mean everything. I get no assistance um, from the state of California whatsoever. Pennsylvania is different. Um, and I think Massachusetts is also very good and that they have Medicaid buy-in programs where if you work, you can pay in a percentage of your income and then um, they'll cover your caregivers. California does not have a program like that um, in California. If you make more than roughly $31,000 a year, you don't qualify for any of the benefits. So um, I am out of pocket for all of my caregivers. And I think it's very important when you are planning your career to think about what kind of job you are going to take. And if that job will allow you to afford having spinal muscular atrophy in the state in which you want to work because having spinal muscular atrophy is very expensive. Um, everything from caregivers to accessible housing. And um, it's, it's really important to think through all those state and logistical issues and research which states will provide you with assistance. And if those states won't provide you with assistance, do you, will you make enough money to cover it yourself and if that answer is no, is are, are there family, are there grants, are there is there anything else that can help you do that? So in Illinois, uh, we have a Medicaid waiver program that pays for uh, my assistance. And the Medicaid waiver program only has uh, an asset limit. They don't have an, in, an income limit anymore. Um, and the asset limit is uh, 17,000, but that doesn't include houses or a house, uh, two cars if you're married, one car if you're not. It doesn't include ABLE accounts either. And so ABLE accounts are separate accounts that you get, I guess you create with with a lawyer um, that's really similar to a trust. Um, and so the Medicaid waiver program cannot count those assets because they're not ex um, readily accessible to you. Um, so for me, um, I have the Medicaid waiver program. We also have um, a Medicaid buy-in program, like Alexa said, um, where you pay just a certain amount for insurance. Um, they're actually my my secondary um, because I have a primary through my current job and will have a primary through my next current job. So the Medicaid uh, buy-in program is still going to be uh, my secondary, uh, so it's the same program. It's just a Medicaid card uh, for 
for somebody who's low income. It's just as long as you're you're paying in that percentage you get in Illinois. So I don't have a, a ton to add to that because, um, like I said, I don't have PCAs. But um, so I do want to say that in, in Virginia, I did find a program early on that was similar to what Alexa and JJ described, where you could buy into it with a percentage of your income, and they would pay a portion of a PCA salary. Um, but when I did the math, I think <clears throat> I was still going to end up paying, um, you know, a lot of money for. Um, for PCA services, and it just wasn't like financially worth it for me, especially because I have my parents, fortunately, and my my wife too. So, um, but yeah, it is kind of, it is kind of an issue, and it's definitely kind of like a looming thing um, in my life because I know you know my parents won't be around forever, unfortunately. So there's going to be you know a day where I'm probably gonna have to pay for it. So pretty much now I'm just like saving everything I can. Um, kind of, you know, with the, the knowledge that someday I'm probably going to have to pay out of pocket unless things change, um, but I'm not going to count on that. But I do want to say, as far as like other benefits, SSI and Medicaid, for me, um, it was definitely kind of a, a scary experience to enter the workforce knowing that was all going to go away. You know what I mean? It kind of felt like you're jumping off a cliff or, or driving off a cliff. Um, but I would say it's it's worked out fine for me. I have good private insurance through my employer. Um, and, you know, you make way more money in the workforce than you ever will with SSI. So I think it's it's definitely a scary um, concept, but I would recommend, you know, giving it a shot and figuring it out. There's, there's different things you can do. I know people who um, will pretty much like, you know, let somebody live in a room in their house for free um, as like a roommate, but instead of paying rent, they'll act as a PCA, you know, so you got to be creative and figure it out. And um, I don't know, I think for me, not trying is scarier than, than trying. So I would say take the risk and give it a go. Yeah, I don't have um, PCA services either. I've tried to figure it out in Tennessee and I just cannot figure it out. There's Tennessee Choices Program, but I don't think I qualify and I can't figure out how to necessarily qualify it with keeping my job. Um, but what I will say is that you need to have like a lot of friends and a lot of good support system. I have a lot of friends in the area that without any, if I send them a text, they'll come over in an emergency. Um, I also chose to purchase a house that was close by to a few friends. So I have multiple friends that live within a few miles of my house. Um, and I chose this neighborhood specifically because of that. So that way I had that backup. If needed, I could always call on them and they could be over pretty easily. Um, that was really important to me. Um, my mom is my primary caregiver. Um, and actually not too long ago, two years ago, she broke her wrist and was unable to lift me for quite a while. And all my friends ended up acting as my attendants for a few months. Um, so we had Google Sheets with spreadsheets and figuring out schedules and who could come over in the morning to get me up and who could put me in bed and um, going through the whole thing. So it's it's great to develop that friend system of people who are willing to do things for you. Um, and like Kyle said, being creative, I did that once where I had a roommate for a while that acted as a PCA. Um, and I let them have room and board for free in exchange for them being my PCA. Um, so it's just kind of figuring out what works for you. Personally, for me, I think working is totally worth it. Um, I would go crazy if I was home. I I need my job. I need different things and I need the stress of the job because believe me it's very stressful but I, I need that in my life and it, it's worth it eventually I'll figure something out I figure I'm not sure what but I'll figure something out that's great thank you all
That's, that was great information. I, I'm gonna merge a few questions here together because um, they're somewhat related. We had a question asking, um, have you ever found yourself balancing the ability to maintain your health regarding SMA and your busy career? Um, another question is just asking about fatigue and how do you cope with fatigue when you're working so many hours in a week while having SMA? Um, Alexa, do you wanna go ahead and start? Sorry, I keep putting you first. <laughs> All good. So I work roughly 50 to 60 hours a week and the weeks are long. But I think when you love what you're doing so much that it doesn't matter how many hours you're working. I definitely believe that it's equal parts willpower and science. So I have the willpower to work and I love working, but then there's also the science to support what I'm doing. So I'm on Spinraza and I take certain steps to ensure my health. And those, those are things that work together to keep me healthy and give me the stamina to get through um, a long work week. It's really important to know when your body will be fatigued. So I know that on a Friday night after I've been working um, 10 to 12 hour days, every day that week, my muscles are going to be a little bit tired and my arms aren't going to want to type. So I know that if I have a big contract to write, I should probably write that contract earlier in the day or earlier in the week before, um, before I'm just exhausted from a long week of work. Something else that's very important is when you're planning your career and choosing what kind of job you want to do, to think about your potential physical limitations. So I picked a job where I used my brain and very little use of my muscles because I sit at a computer all day and I read and write contracts. And so it's important to plan ahead and also think about your future. Like if you aren't sure if your SMA might get worse down the road and you can do this type of job now, um, think about your future and if you think you'll be able to do that type of job forever. So it's a lot, it's a lot of planning. And, um, but I think most importantly, it's making sure that you love what you do because then the physical part won't be as big of a challenge. So like Alexa, my job requires minimal to no uh, physical abilities other than talking, um, which obviously we're doing right now. Um, so with that, um, yeah, my voice by the end of the day sometimes does get tired. Um, I won't lie. Uh, however, I will say water is life uh, because I realize that I personally need to drink somewhere between 40 and 60 ounces of water a day um, to maintain um, minimal pain as well as minimal fatigue. Um, so with everything I do, um, I just make sure that I, I do have certain uh, downtimes between, between um, sessions as well as between meetings that I go to. So even if it's 10 minutes, you know, what I'll do sometimes, I'll just recline back in my chair and just close my eyes for five minutes um, just to give me that that quick little kind of burst of energy I need to get through that next hour. Um, I'm on a RISD. I used to be on Spinraza. Uh, but I was one of the, the few ones where it deteriorated by kidneys to the point where I couldn't take it anymore. Um, so it was the, um, it's my go-to now. I have to drink a cup of coffee in the morning to wake up because um, if I don't, I, I literally will not wake up mentally until probably 11 o'clock. Um, and I would also say, if you know your your sleep cycle, um, whether you sleep 
later into the day and you stay up later at night or you wake up early in the morning and go to bed earlier, making sure your career fits with that. Um, for me, most of my sessions are in the afternoon and evening. Um, so I'm mostly working like 12 to 8 or 1 to 9 um, with sessions. Um, with my current position as a clinical director, I have to work mornings as well. Um, so I only work most weeks, like sometimes three days, sometimes four days, because in my in my contract, um, which I'm sure Alexa could write, um, I only have to work uh, 37 and a half hours per week. Um, so when those 37 and a half hours are up, I'm done, basically. And um, so really ensuring that you are taking those breaks, taking time for yourself, and just really knowing your schedule is the way to go. Um, in maintaining and keeping that fatigue at bay. So uh, I'll echo what Alexa and JJ said about finding the right career. Um, <clears throat> like I said, I was originally a communications major. I really wanted to be a film director. Um, but then when I kind of found software engineering, I realized that this is kind of a much more viable career path. Um, and then I could do the entire thing by the computer and I could probably do that forever. So um, that was a factor, but I, I still love it. Like, it's not like I'm complaining. Um, but I would say, so for me, um, another big perk of working for the federal government, and I swear I'm not a recruiter, but another perk is that um, you are not a lot, it's illegal to work for the federal government for free. So I get paid for 40 hours, and I'm not allowed to do anything over that. Um, and there's some leeway in there, but that's pretty much the rule and nobody else is either. So I don't worry that when I go home at the end of the day that somebody else is staying late and getting ahead of me. Um, so that's really nice. Uh, but secondly, I would say finding a routine um, is really important. Usually at the end of the day, I come home and I'll just lay down for like an hour or so and just kind of veg out and recharge. Um, and that really helps. Also, recharging over the weekend. I try and have at least one day over the weekend where I don't do anything um, so I can rest up um, and not be exhausted on Monday when I go to work. Um, and then last, I would just say, remember your priorities. Um, you know, remember to prioritize your health over um, meetings or, or bosses or whatever. Because at the end of the day, if you're not healthy, you're not going to be a good employee anyway. So, um, you know, lately, the past few months, I've been in a position with a lot more responsibility. and I've been super busy. and I have days where I have meetings from like 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. nonstop with no breaks in between. Um, so on days like that, I just, I'll skip a meeting. And, and you know, I think, I think Alexa mentioned this earlier, um, or maybe it was Sarah, and you don't have to like explain to people why you're doing it. Just say, I have a conflict, I have another obligation, whatever. Um, but I'll skip the meetings just so I can go to the bathroom and eat lunch. Um, and uh, there's like a overachieving side of me that's like, uh, why am I doing that? Everyone's gonna hate me, you know? Um, but in reality, nobody cares. People understand. Everyone's human, everyone wants to eat lunch. I have employees and if they ever came to me and said, I can't go to this meeting because it's the only time I can eat, I'd be like, absolutely, like skip it. I'll tell you what happens, go eat. Um, so yeah, remember priorities. Your health is more important than your job. Um, and uh, yeah. So. Um, one thing that I did was my job is has quite a bit of physical aspects to it as far as doing the actual research. Um, there's a lot of mental part as far as the organizing goes and being on a computer and things like that. But there are a lot of things that I have to do in the lab physically. Um, and going into this position, I knew that. And at the time I could do everything just fine and I still can today, which is great. Um, but when I chose this career, I also made a backup plan because I love backup plans. Um, and I did the backup plan of I could always teach biology or 
some sort of college course. Um, and so that's always been my kind of backup plan. When I can't do the physical things that are needed in the lab, I can always switch careers and try to do something teaching wise. Um, so having backup plans, you know, if you're strong enough to do something that you just love and you really want to do it, go for it. Just have, you know, have that backup plan for another career path that you can easily switch to. Um, I think that's important. One thing that I do, um, like Alexa said, on Fridays, I know I'm going to be tired. I know my arms are going to be wore out and just done for the day. Um, so I'll typically make sure I have a frozen pizza in the freezer so I don't have to cook dinner. Um, and a lot of times on Sundays when I have more arm strength, I will do prepping for the week, whether that's cutting up vegetables or whatever, so that when I come home from work and I am tired, then those things are already done and I can quickly cook meals. On weeks that I know I've got a lot going on that week, I'll try and prep meals that are just like throw them in the oven or in the microwave and they're already done. Um, so I do a lot of things like that, trying to think ahead of when will I be tired and what will I be able to do then? Um, I'm trying to do as much on the weekends as I can to prep for the week so that when it comes to the week, I'm not doing that much afterwards, after work. Um, because I know that a lot of times I will be tired. That's great. Thank you all so much. You have all given so much great advice already, but I, I have one final question for you. We have so many teenagers on tonight. We have so many college students on tonight, and we have so many of their parents as well. Do you have any advice that you would give to any of these young adults and or to their parents? Alexa, you want to start? Sure. Um, I think the best the best piece of advice that that I received I actually received from my mom many many years ago when I was in like high school or early college, and she um, told me in a very nice way that whether it's right or wrong, people are going to sometimes look at me as less than simply because I am in a wheelchair. Not that that's the right thing, but it exists in the world. And so she taught me the importance of working very hard and um, basically making something of myself and not slacking off in, in the workplace because I never want to have people, you never want to give people a reason to, to think that you're less than because you're in a wheelchair. So I think the the most important thing that you can do is work incredibly hard, um, work incredibly hard and show everyone that you are just as capable as they are and that your spinal muscular atrophy is not going to inhibit your work in any way, shape or form and um, never, never let your work ethic be a reason that somebody um, that somebody looks down on on you or what you're capable of. So I'm going to go actually kind of into therapist mode uh, because I'm all about balance with my clients and finding that balance in your life. Um, so I will say follow your heart, but be realistic because the thing is, is the world is not created for us at the at the current time, obviously. You know, accommodations have to be made. Certain uh, physical structures have to be made to make our world a more accommodating place. And so what I mean by following your heart but be realistic, you know, obviously a lot of us can't go in the military, right? We can't become police officers. Um, we can't be firefighters. But we can be things that do support those professions. So if that is where your heart is leading you to, you know, you 
you could become a lawyer like Alexa. You could become a therapist like me. Um, and we all have different passions and follow those passions, but make sure that you're being realistic about it so that you don't become disappointed when, when you get to that point of realizing, hey, I'm so far into my career in, in college and working toward that career, and then all of a sudden having that realization, oh, I can't do that. And then, you know, going through the grieving process of not being able to go through that um, can be hard. And I know that, you know, and, and, and so that's why I say, follow your heart, but be realistic. So. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, I would say, um, as somebody who um, interviews and hires people. My advice uh, to people trying to get a job, and this is really not limited to um, people with disabilities, this is applicable to anybody. I would say that success in the workplace is at least 90% work ethic and, and just hustle. Um, and I'm not even talking about going above and beyond, although that's great. Definitely do it if you want to. But even just, just doing your job and doing it well and being responsible and being accountable. If you just do those things, you're gonna you're gonna excel um, you know, amongst your peers because you would really be surprised how many people in the workforce, um, you know, able-bodied or otherwise, who just don't um, don't do a good job. You know, so like just like do your job and do it well, and you're not just gonna be successful, but you're gonna you're gonna excel. Um, and I would also say, don't be afraid to fail. You know, it's like I said earlier, it can be kind of a scary thing to go in the workforce with a disability, um, but it's 100% worth it. Um, I, I love feeling tired at the end of the day. I sleep great and I have less anxiety. Um, so it's not, it's scary, but don't let it paralyze you and, and give it a shot. And if it doesn't work, whatever, move on and try something else, but don't be afraid to try things. Um, and then lastly, I would say, really look at your disability, look at SMA as an advantage, um, not as a disadvantage because people who are disabled with SMA, um, we tend to be, you know, good problem solvers, um, creative, adaptable. Like our lives have taught us this from the earliest of ages, you know, it's taught us to be resilient and patient. Um, like I said earlier, I had PCA since I was 12, so Effectively, I've been a manager since I was 12 years old. Um, and I was signing time sheets since I was 18. So in the past few years when I've gotten into management, it's kind of come naturally to me because I've had years of experience beforehand. Um, and it's set me kind of apart from my peers because you know a new manager um, wouldn't have that kind of experience that I had. So um, those kind of things that, um, get ingrained into you and that um, have made your life difficult to this point are actually going to be an advantage. Um, so think of it that way and use it that way um, in the future when you're trying to figure out what you want to do and whether you're thinking, you know, am I going to succeed or fail or should I try this? Um, yeah, you have an advantage, not a disadvantage. And and actually one last thing, um, if you ever want to email me, I'm always happy to talk or answer questions or whatever. My email address is my first and last name, Kyle Durkowski at gmail.com. Easy to remember. So get in touch with me if you want. Um, so I will say one thing that I think is a great piece of advice for anybody with SMA, especially if you use a wheelchair, is that people are going to remember you. So always remember that you are being watched and you never know where things will lead. Um, so back in high school, I was very active in 4-H um, and did a lot of things with 4-H. And at one of the dinners or something, I met the dean of ag, and I didn't think anything of it at the time, not a thing. It was just a normal thing within 4-H. You just met somebody, it's no big deal, whatever, and you go on. 
And she, when I started college at UT, she actually remembered me. And because she remembered me and somehow I had made an impression on her, um, that's what got me my job. So she actually was the one that connected me with the PI that I currently work for and that I worked for it throughout undergrad as well. <clears throat> because she thought it would be a great fit for me. Um, so always remembering that you never know who you're speaking with or how it's going to lead and take the opportunities as they come. Like have fun with life and take whatever opportunities you can. Um, you never know. You never know what you'll end up liking and you never know what will end up coming through it. Um, and like Kyle said, I'm happy to talk at any time as well. Um, for me, if you email the Tennessee Cur at CurisMA, it'll come to me. Um, and then I can give you my private email address as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much. That was great um, closing insights from everyone. Thank you. Um, so thank you again to our four wonderful panelists. And thank you all of our attendees for joining us tonight. Um, you're going to be receiving a follow-up email with a survey link. And as always, we appreciate any feedback that you have to share with us. Uh, and again, we're so thankful for the incredible support from our presenting sponsor, Biogen, for making the career panel webinar series possible. Um, we hope that you will join us for our next two um, career panels as well on Wednesday, October 20th and Monday, November 15th. Um, please feel free to reach out to community support at curisma.org if you have any additional questions. Other than that, have a great evening, everyone. Thank you again.